Okay, intro to Zach's stuff. So this was Halloween is what I'm going to be sharing. Um, there's a lot of EVPs kind of in the middle, a lot of noises. I have decided that instead of chopping it up, I'm just going to let it run from front to back. It's basically the beginning of um, the ghost tour in Zach's museum to the end. Plus, I will add on any of the footage EVPs that I captured at the end of that. I wanted to give a shout out to my fans that were there, that got to experience it with me. It was so much fun. I hope we get to do it again. I wanted to give a shout out to Zach. Thank you so much for letting us come in for Halloween into the basement. Um, it is by invitation only, so please do not ask Zach or any of the staff if you can go down there. It was so exciting. I hope that it's not my last time, Zach. Hint, hint. And I can't wait to go back again. So make sure you guys follow along. Now this is gonna be strange. There is no video, only EVP was allowed. Um, so it was basically audio recording. So there's gonna be no video footage. I'll probably just put a picture up and follow it through the whole thing. So you just have to listen and read the screen if I have replays. And basically it's like you get to go on the tour with me. Don't get bored, I'm sorry, it's the way it is. It was the rules of Zach and I always follow the rules. So make sure you guys watch and I will catch you guys here in a bit. Well, over here, the biggest piece that we have on display is the Devil's Roulette table. Uh, this table uh, has multiple reasons why it is called the Devil's Roulette table. None of which Zach knew about when he purchased it. In fact, you will find this theme often throughout the museum. Zach will purchase something on a whim and then uh, quickly realize that it fits in the museum as if it were meant to be here by fate. Uh, now, again, as I mentioned before, there are multiple reasons this is called the Devil's Roulette Table. Uh, well, this particular table was actually owned by Meyer Lansky, who's the shortest of the four gentlemen on display here. Uh, he had this table operating at his casino in Saratoga Springs. Meyer Lansky was a known mob accountant. Uh, now, the first of many reasons this is called the Devil's Roulette Table is if you found yourself betting at this particular table. It was like betting against the devil himself because, of course, when it comes to the mafia and their money, they do not like to lose. These batteries here uh, controlled magnets in this wheel, which dictated where the little metal ball landed. Now, the second reason this is called the Devil's Roulette Table is, in fact, in the address, which is located on the opposite side of the table, and that golden diamond, uh, can you please right there where I'm you're, you're looking a little too far there. Right next to the black 35. That's all right. I have it memorized. It says BC. Oh, here we go. Go ahead, sir. Read that out loud. East Columbia. All right. 666, which of course we all are familiar with, is the devil's number. Uh, the third reason this is called the Devil's Roulette Table is, in fact, if you add up all of these numbers here on the wheel, that also equals up to 666. Coincidence? I think not. Audit me. Now, the Mafia could cheat you from your money, but what would happen if the Mafia tried to cheat? I'm sorry, the Mafia could cheat you from your money, but what would happen if you tried to cheat the Mafia from their money? From their money? From their money. From their money. Yes, you'd be dead. You'd be sleeping with the fishes. And if you did happen to find the fishes to be your neighbors, well then congratulations. We can rent this next room off. You had a very gracious 80% off. Please follow me into our funeral home. And go ahead and please make your uh, make yourself comfortable because we will be spending eternity in this next room. For the next three minutes, it really depends on how quickly I decide to speak. Please go ahead and make 
will be there are 16 of us, so there may be a few chairs short. But it looks like some of you are making it work, which is quite all right. We do have one more chair there, if you want to do that, sit down. Now, I mentioned in the previous room there are various things throughout this museum that fit as if it were fake. This beautiful stained glass window that you see on your left is one of those things. Uh, this particular window was um, hand painted uh, in a church in New York in the 1800s. I'm sorry, for a church in New York in the 1800s. Now, when Zach acquired this, he, uh, he thought he would need to adjust the windows or the room in some way in order for it to fit, but was quickly um, surprised at the fact that he did not need to adjust anything in order for it to fit perfectly right there. Now, speaking of things that seem to fit in this museum, I'd like everyone to please welcome my very good friend here, Giant. Amicitia, amor at veritas, friendship, love, and truth. These are the words of the Odd Fellows, one of the oldest known living surviving secret societies still in existence today. The Odd Fellows date back to 1730s in London. Now that the Odd Fellows were quite beneficial to their communities, oftentimes helping those who could not afford to rest in peace, the Odd Fellows would provide the financial assistance necessary for funeral arrangements and burial services. But there's always a catch, always a cost. You see, the odd fellows were quite macabre in their nature. Many times they would ask their new initiates to stare to the face of death, to gauge their own mortality. They would look right in the eyes. We seem to be missing the eyes. Everybody check your pockets for eyes. They feel like grapes with the skins removed. Wait, Giant, let's pump the brakes there. How do you know what eyeballs feel like? Hobbies. Another odd thing about these fellows is that many times the bodies did not end up in the ground like they should. No. In fact, they would end up in the floorboards, in the walls, or like this very fellow right here, found in the attic of a New York insane asylum. There was once an odd fellow temple. Very odd. Very odd indeed. Thank you for gracing us with your presence, Giant. You may give him a round of applause. It's very hard to now, in our Halloween special, which premiered on Saturday, uh, some of you may have watched it, uh, we caught a black entity at this very kneeler. Who knows what it was there for? Perhaps paying respects to the newfound dead that call this room their home, or perhaps it was visiting its once physical form. Now, uh, please feel free to take a closer look at these real human skeletons as we make our way into the next exhibit, which is the Haunted Art Gallery. Now, please arise and follow me. various energies you may encounter throughout the museum. Um, this, um, this, um, this, um, this room does have one of those energies. Some of you may have felt a little bit dizzy as you entered the threshold. Some of you may have felt physically heavier. Uh, this 
is because of the energy in this room, and you will experience that again uh, in a num numerous other rooms throughout the museum. Now, there is a lot to go over in this room, so please forgive me if I speak quickly, but I am going to start on my left here with the Crying Boy paintings. Now, these paintings are of a young boy named Don. Uh, he tragically, his parents tragically died in a fire, and he was a runaway. It was believed that he could start fires with his mind, so he was nicknamed Diablo because of this. At the age of 19, he was driving around in his vehicle. When he crashed that vehicle, it then erupted into a column of flame, which charred his body so bad, the only way they could identify him was from his identification card. Now, uh, these paintings were very popular in the 1970s. These paintings were very popular in the 1970s in England. However, any household that found these paintings hanging within their walls would, would always mysteriously burn down to the ground. Oftentimes, the painting themselves were the only thing that would survive that fire. Because of this, firefighters from all across the nation banded together and asked that anyone who owned these paintings to please send them in so that way they could hold a controlled burning of the paintings. Obviously, not all the paintings made it to those locations because, of course, we have two here on display at the Haunted Museum, and why Zach would want two paintings known to cause fires in his museum full of priceless artifacts is beyond me. Sometimes suspect he's a little bit of a crazy person. As we move on, we have another painting. This painting was... Um, I'm sorry, this painting is the prequel to the most haunted painting in the world. This painting is called The Hands Invent Him. Now, the most haunting painting, of, the most haunted painting in the world is a painting called The Hands Resist Him, and it is depicted in the plaque in front of the painting here. I'll give you a brief description of what it is and why it's haunted. Now, it is of a young boy that is the artist at five years old. He is standing next to a doll, which is his spirit guide. Uh, he is standing in front of a patio door, uh, which leads to the realm of impossibility. Now, uh, what makes that painting so haunted is that oftentimes the painting will be, uh, the little boy in the painting will be seen moving, and sometimes he will actually leave the painting altogether. Now, Zach tried to acquire that specific painting for this museum. Uh, however, the current owner was asking for way too much money, so instead he contacted the artist who is still alive and agreed to paint him this 100% original painting. And uh, they did not discuss details whatsoever. And a few days before Zach acquired this, he did tweet about, about a haunting he experienced, which is also on display in that flat. Uh, the tweet says that he was walking through the halls when he heard a tricycle bell and is responding to that tricycle sound, a ball in one of his chandeliers popped his out. <coughs> then he receives this painting a few days later, which of course features a tricycle. Now in the back corner there, we have a memorial that is dedicated to Mrs. Lottie Wingert. Lottie Wingert lived in this room and she did die in this room. And it's confirmed by her daughter, Shirley, who sat in this very bench and scribed into the mirror over there. Now for those of you who don't know what scrying is, it is when you um, speak into a mirror with the intent of sometimes even succeeding to contact the other side. So Lottie sat, I'm sorry, Shirley sat in this, sorry ma'am, if you could put your phone away, no texting uh, is allowed on the tour or no phone and no photography. Um, now, Shirley sat in this very bench and she scribed into this mirror. For those of you who don't know what scrying is, it's when you speak into a mirror with the intent and sometimes succeeding to contact the other side. So Shirley sat in this um, bench, she scribed into the mirror and was successful in contacting her mother Lottie, who uh, confirming that she does still roam the halls of this museum. Now, I'm a firm believer that Lottie is still with us. I was actually in this room by myself one day when I felt a presence nearby. And I felt that it was Lottie, so I began to speak out loud. And I, as I turned to leave, I said goodbye to Lottie when suddenly the temperature in the room dropped 40 degrees and I was overwhelmed with a sense of protection and a sense of belonging. Uh, it is the belief of the other tour guides as well as myself that Lottie blessed me that day and they're all very jealous because of it, as I would be too. Now in the back corner over there we have a desk. That desk once belonged to Mina Miller Edison and Thomas Edison. Uh, and that desk is the perfect example of what is known as the stone tape theory, uh, which is the the suggestion, for instance, that this desk is to contain residual thought energy directly implemented into the wood through years of writing by Mr. and Mrs. Edison. Who, in other <coughs> words, who knows what types of creative genius ideas were cooked up at this desk? The stone tape theory suggests that uh, that energy is soaked into the wood and it now emits it to this day. Now to my right, we have possibly the most haunted object in the world. I'm not in the world, I'm sorry, that's later on in the tour. The most haunted object in this room. This is Bella Lugosi's haunted mirror. 
Bela Lugosi was very famous for his portrayal of Dracula in the early years of the monster films. And what a lot of people do not know about Bela Lugosi is that he was very heavily influenced by the occult. And it is said that he practiced scrying in this very mirror quite often. Uh, after he passed away, a gentleman named Frank moved into his household. Uh, now, Frank was a renowned criminal lawyer. And he was the victim of what is believed to be a very brutal mob hit. A screwdriver was driven into his both of his knees. A screwdriver was driven into both of his elbows. He was then shot in the chest. And a screwdriver was used to dig the bullet out. Now, 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 um, the mirror eventually fell into the hands of uh, his niece, Cindy Lee. Niece, Cindy Lee. Niece, Cindy Lee. Niece, Cindy Lee. Uh, who was hung it up in her household one day. When her daughter was using it, she felt something gripping her neck. She also felt something bite down on her shoulder. Is it there? Is it there? Is it there? Is it that moment that they very frantically and very graciously donated this mirror to this museum? Now, I will let you look into this mirror if you want, but if you don't, that's quite all right. I'm going to ask you to please make your way across the hall into that empty room right over there, where the rest of the group will be joining you in a moment. Mm -hmm. All right, and for those of you who do wish to look in the mirror, I'm going to ask you to please start a line here and wrap it around the bench. <coughs> we'll actually try and like have an actual cohesive line. I'm like, I told you. You're right where you need to go. All right, once you're done viewing, please uh, make your way across the hall. Right across the hall there, sir. There you go. People to the front, tell the people to the back. Now, before we continue our tour, I do have a word from our sponsors. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the office of Dr. Jack Kevorkian, also known as Dr. Death. During his lifetime, he was at the center of much controversy 
as he proclaimed to help terminally ill patients end their lives with assisted suicide, many of those deaths occurring in his Volkswagen van. During the filming of my TV series, Deadly Possessions on the Travel Channel, I interviewed his famed attorney, Jeffrey Figer, who told me they thought that they had the van destroyed at a scrapyard. So we took it to this uh, junkyard. We had it crushed into a uh, metal ball. It was always my belief that that van had been destroyed uh, as a result of us paying the guy. But you never saw it destroyed. I never did, and neither did the work. Well, Jeffrey Figer thought wrong because I acquired the death van, and it's here at the Haunted Museum. Identical to dents and, and, and creases in the van, and I don't think anybody could have contemplated that. It's just impossible to do. In history, that van will be valuable not because of its macabre, but because it's uh, so important in terms of medical advancement of assisted suicide. Part that, van, history. that van will be considered important. In fact, that van, you'll find that the Smithsonian would want that van. hundred and thirty the, the, that's the number that there is to the public there were a lot more well over 200 he was doing them in the van I now ask that one of you open the door to your left and get ready to experience an object that contains the energies spirits of over 100 deaths now, before we do enter this next room, uh, please be aware that it is a room of memoriam for the patients who decided to end their lives in the van. So if we could please keep talking to a minimum, and if you must say something, please keep it reduced to a whisper. Also, the music that you hear in this next room uh, is Dr. Gorkin. He wrote, composed, and recorded this music. Uh, please note touching the van as well. You can now leave the group in, sir.
Oh, you're, you're actually doing it. Zach acquired these from a penitentiary in Arkansas and quickly realized that he needed, uh, he did not need to adjust the bars whatsoever in order for them to fit in this room. Now I'm only going to go over a few items in this room, so please look around at your leisure. There is a lot to see and very little time to see it. The, I'm going to start with that Santa Claus outfit that is in the back of the room there. That outfit was once owned by J.R. Robinson, who is known as the world's first internet serial killer. We also have in the back corner across from it uh, tons of murderabilia from Richard Ramirez, who is better known as the Night Stalker. He terrorized the LA area in the 1980s. We also have uh, murderabilia from one Charles Manson, which includes a letter that he wrote. It is framed on the wall there, and it features his handprint. You are allowed to touch your hand to his if you want, but please be aware that is Charles Manson's blood on the letter. In this display to my left, we also have tons of artwork done by John Wayne Gacy, who is known as uh, a kind gent neighborhood gentleman who addresses a clown and cheer up the children at the local children's hospital. However, it was later revealed he was responsible for the rape and murder of 33 young boys. Now, we'll only be spending just a few more moments in this room, so please linger around and take in as much as you possibly can. This staircase is better known around the museum as the staircase to hell. It does lead to the most haunted bill or room in the building, which is the basement. Now, uh, Zach interviewed two women during his ghost adventure special where he did a lockdown in the museum. One woman claimed that she broke in in her youth in the 70s when this building was abandoned. She made her way into the basement and saw pentagrams drawn all, through, all on the floor. She did not stay very long to see who drew them or why. This confirms the suspicions of satanic rituals taking place in this museum. It is believed that those satanic rituals that took place in the basement are uh, the core of what causes the rest of the room, the house to be haunted. Um, now, Zach interviewed another woman during this episode who worked here when this building belongs to the Nevada State Bar Association, and that woman described that the lawyers would always get a very eerie, creepy feeling around the staircase, and they refused to enter the basement unless they were in very large groups. 
they actually, uh, the feeling got so bad that the lawyers would actually salt the entryway to their offices. Uh, she began to have an emotional breakdown, and in fact, Zach thought she was having a medical episode. And Zach escorted her away from the staircase where she regained her um, composure. And on her drive home, she watched a scratch uh, manifest itself on her hand. She then took a photograph and sent it to Zach. Now, Zach utilizes the energies that swirl around in the basement for various rituals. The subject of some of those rituals you will be seeing throughout the museum, one of which is a skull that we will be viewing later on in the tour. Um, no one is allowed down there, unfortunately, so we are actually going to be making our way into this room. And you will feel an energy shift through this room as well, because there's quite a haunted object in there. It is Ed Gein's Cursed Cauldron. mama's boy in the sense that when his mom had died, so did his sanity. It was then that he began to snatch bodies from the local gravesite with the very shovel we have on display there. Now, Ed Gein was active in uh, Plain with Plainfield, Wisconsin in the 1950s, and he was nicknamed the Butcher of Plainfield because of this. Ed Gein did eventually murder two women and was convicted and sent to a mental institution, but we'll come back to that in a moment. Now, what Ed Gein would do with these bodies that he would snatch from the gravesite is he would use their parts for his arts and crafts projects. He actually had a full skin suit made out of female skin. He had a shirt, a pair of pants, and a mask. He would put all of these on in order to become his mother. Uh, he had various other objects that he made people out of. He experimented a lot with human taxidermy. Uh, and what he would use this cauldron for is to cook up some of those parts in order to soften them so he could use them for his arts and crafts. Um, now, after he was convicted of those, of those two murders and sent to the insane asylum, um, an elderly woman purchased this cauldron knowing what it was used for. She then painted flowers all along the outside of the cauldron in memoriam for the bodies in the victims of Ed Gein. She eventually passed away, and her son, along with friends and family members, cleared her estate out. Six of those friends and family members touched this cauldron, and all six of those people suddenly died within the next 18 months. 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 Now Zach had Lady Snake in the museum. You're right. Something just stomped right behind us, like hard. It was like, yeah, and it literally yeah. like both moved. There's, there's a lot of hauntings that occur in this room, especially even in that corner. In fact, That's where I had are, a yeah. tour guide standing in that corner, a female tour guide standing in that corner before we opened up shop one day when she felt hands grip her shoulders and push her down into the floorboards. Wow. So things do happen over there. Things actually happen all throughout this room, especially to our female patrons. There's actually something about you that I suspect reminds Ed Gein of his mother. So if you do feel a little tickle on the back of your head, just be aware that that is Ed Gein possibly saying hello to you. Now, uh, Zach had Lady Snake visit the museum for his Halloween special, which premiered on Saturday. She made her way into this room and began to perform rituals with this cauldron in order to tap into Ed Gein's power. He, uh, she used actually a portion of Jay Wasley's blood. She also used some string and some tobacco. Um, and it is our belief she was successful because ever since then, more hauntings have happened in this room, like the cloud stomp you heard in the corner over there. Now, please follow me to our next stop, which is right across the hall. Maybe they didn't want to reveal that until it was there. You know what I mean? Right through here, sir. Go ahead and try and fill up all the empty spaces. It is a tight fit. Is 
Now these wax heads were donated to us from the Win or by the Winchester Mystery House. There's some room in here, ma'am, if you'd like to make your way in. Uh, now the Winchester Mystery House, which is located in San Jose, California, is confirmed haunted. Now Sarah Winchester, uh, the heiress of the Winchester fortune, believed that the victims of her family's rifles were coming back to haunt her. So she acquired the advice of a medium on how to uh, get rid of these spirits. The medium then advised her to continue to add and build onto the house in order to confuse the spirits. Um, the house eventually got so big that it not only confused the dead, it began to confuse the living as well. People would wander the halls of the museum for hours at a time, not knowing where they were or how to get out. Um, now, again, it is a confirmed haunted house. They are open for tours. Uh, and again, they are open in San Jose, California. And if you do find yourself in San Jose, California, I suggest you make the short trip to Santa Cruz, California, and visit the Santa Cruz mystery spot. Now, if you'll please follow me uh, down this hallway. And as we make our way down this hallway, you will see a wall of oddities on your right-hand side. Do not linger too long because we will be making our way back into this hallway. So you can have a second look at some of these oddities. Now this room is going to work along the same lines of the murderabilia. I'm just going to talk about each uh, display. Go ahead and look around at your leisure. Uh, to my right, we do have memorabilia from a gentleman named Red Fox. He starred in Sanford and Son. Uh, he was a local celebrity, as in the sense that he lived in Las Vegas. And near the end of his life, he fell into some financial issues and was the victim of what he describes oh to be a very uh, emotional IRS raid on his estate. Now, it is said that uh, because of the emotions he experienced when he died a few years later, his soul actually attached itself to some of the items that were confiscated from him on that day. To my, I might be here, we have the very same shirt that Keith Ledger wore in the motion picture Patriots, along with its certificate of authenticity. Now to my left here, we have one of Liberace's many pianos. This particular piano was purchased by Zach from Dr. Lonnie Hammerman. For those of you who are Las Vegas locals, you may recognize the name. He is a renowned neurosurgeon who lives in the Las Vegas area. He lives off of Sand Hill in Tropicana and has an estate filled to the brim with oddities of his own that he opens up once a year for touring. And I believe it is open uh, this weekend or this week for touring. Now next to that we have a chair. That chair once belonged to Michael Jackson and it's said to be the very same chair that Dr. Conrad Murray would sit in while administering protocol to the King of Pop. When they removed this chair from his room, they didn't find an empty bottle of protocol underneath it. Zach acquired this chair directly from Michael Jackson's estate. Beyond that, we have a shrine dedicated to Patrick Swayze. Uh, now Patrick Swayze is one of Zach's heroes and Zach believes that the motion picture ghost is an accurate depiction of the afterlife. Uh, that photograph in his passport, which only expired about two weeks ago, that photograph was taken two months before he was diagnosed with cancer, so he did have the deadly disease, but did not know it yet. Beyond that, we have the very same outfit that Truman Capote was found dead in. Now, Truman Capote uh, is famous for writing Breakfast at Tiffany's and in Cold Blood. We also have a variety of prescription pills that were found in his bloodstream upon his death. As you can see, he had a bit of a problem. As well as two slides depicting Truman Capote doing a line of cocaine. And I'm actually told it's very difficult to find a photograph of Truman Capote not doing a line of cocaine. Now in the back corner there we have two dolls. Those dolls were once owned by Shirley Temple, so I assume they were once uh, considered cute. We also have a collection of shirts, one of which owned by the man in black himself, Johnny Cash, uh, and this is the very same shirt he is wearing in the photograph above it. We also have a shirt that was once owned by Steve Jobs, uh, as well as his name tag from the company Next, which he created after Apple fired him. Big mistake on their part. Now I'm going to ask the group to please make their way back down that hallway of oddities. We're going to stop in front of Zach's study and take time to talk about that skull. Right down this way, sir. Please try and squish in as much as possible so everyone can see what's going on here. Now this is Zach's study. If we can actually have uh, you walk up a bit more, try and scrunch in a bit more here. I know it's a tight fit. Uh, there are a lot of us on this tour. Now this is Zach's study. Every so often you might find you may find him in here enjoying some literature, but uh, the main thing on display is the skull. And what makes the skull so different than the other skulls that you've seen throughout the museum is that this skull is confirmed haunted. Zach found the skull during a, um, an investigation in Virginia City, Nevada, and uh, he decided to bring it home with him. And in fact, the lady that 
he bought the skull from uh, exclaimed that it is a cursed skull and it does haunt, it did haunt the family that owned it before him. Now, Zach decided to bring the skull home, which was a big mistake because as soon as he crossed the threshold of his house with the skull at hand, hauntings started to occur all around his household. One of which, which he uh, directly connects to the skull, happened a few nights later when he was sound asleep. He was violently awoken and dragged out of bed. Now, this skull was the subject of a voodoo ritual which took place downstairs during our Halloween special, which premiered on Saturday. Uh, and during this ritual, uh, more investigations were going on throughout the rest of the museum. Um, and the obulus device that was present in the basement actually caught uh, two of the same word, and that word was Norman. So it is believed that this skull is Norman. In fact, another device that was being used somewhere else in the building caught uh, the word Norman as well. Also, the obulus device that um, they were using in the basement caught a word of a cry for help. So who knows what Norman was needing help from. Now I'm going to ask the group to please make their way back down the hallway, take a left and wait for me in that room with the, uh, that little hallway with the taxidermy. I'll be joining you in a moment. But do not go beyond that room with the taxidermy. Please come down this way, come down this way. Hold on, sir. Now we're going to, oh, this isn't everyone. Now we're going to make our way uh, through the door on the right-hand side of this room. Uh, please pay attention to the portrait. That portrait is of a gentleman named P.T. Barnum. Uh, he is one of the founders of the Barnum and Bailey Circus Act, and he was very famous for his sideshows and freak shows, and he is one of Zach's idols because of this. Now you're going to make your way through that door, go all the way down the hallway into a room with a miniature circus, and wait for me in that room. Your circus was hand carved by a gentleman named Jonathan Lee. I'm sorry, Jonathan Lee is the most famous person. Uh, this beautiful miniature circus was hand carved by a gentleman named Robert Clark in 1945 for a museum called Carousel World. When Zach acquired this model, it did not have enough gruesome details for his liking, so he added one of his own. If you pay attention to the back of the tiger cage there, you'll notice a little boy who is not enjoying his time at the cir circus. In fact, he is currently serving as lunch to the tigers. Also, as you make your way through this room, uh, on your left-hand side, you will find a collection of vintage uh, circus tickets, one of which is signed by P.T. Barnum himself, inviting a VIP to his sideshow. Also, as we make our way into this next uh, room, on your left-hand side, you will see the head of a lion. That is Wallace the Lion. He is responsible for three of his trainer's deaths before he was finally euthanized.
Now before we move on, I um, am going to tell you about our fortune teller that we do have on site. Uh, she does read fortune, uh, palm your cards in this uh, fortune telling teller caravan during tours. If you are interested in that, please inquire about it at the end of the tour in the gift shop. Also, as you make your way up this staircase, you will see various mummies. The one at the very top of the staircase is a real human mummy. This next portion of the tour, you will be going without me. If you are tall, please watch your head. Did I have anybody in this group who is chlorophobic, scared of clowns? Would you like to leave the group? Yeah. All right, come on up here. You're very brave, man. I had to put a side note in here because I felt so bad for this girl. So this girl is under 18 and she's there with her mom. She's one of my fans, so I know you're out there somewhere. <laughs> she thought the tour guide said, do you want to leave the group because she has a fear of clowns? Apparently he said, do you want to lead the group? So he made this poor girl go upstairs alone. I felt so bad for her. And then she was so scared. She was in tears. And then I felt bad because I told her not to worry about it, that there weren't any real people up here where there, there didn't used to be people in costume that would jump out at you. Now Zach has changed that. So just FYI warning. And I'm sorry to, to this girl, wherever you are, I did not mean to lie to you. He really didn't have people there in the first two times I went. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Now, I realize that some energies may be high. Uh, half of you are probably very excited after that last exhibit. Some of you are probably terrified out of your mind after that last exhibit. Uh, it is up to me to kind of bring that energy back because we are about to take quite a shift because beyond the door behind me is the most haunted object in the world of the Divic Box. Now, I'll give you a brief history of the Divic Box before we enter and you can decide whether or not you want to see it. The Divic Box was originally owned by a 103-year-old Holocaust survivor by the name of Avila. She believed that uh, demons were following her from the concentration camp, so when she fled to Spain, she purchased a vintage Jewish wine cabinet in, or in order to perform rituals to capture those demons inside of that wine cabinet. She kept it on the top shelf of a bookcase in her sewing room, and whenever her family would ask her what was inside the box, she would spit between her fingers three times and say, Divic or Keslam. It was her wishes to be buried with the box. However, that did not happen. However, that did not, however, that did not, however, that did not happen. Instead, oh. She got the chills. No, something touched me and it made me drop my huh. thing. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Well, that does tend to happen in this room. to happen in, to happen in, to happen in this room and Ooh. the next room. Um, now, uh, it was Avila's wishes to be buried with the box when she passed away. However, that did not happen. Instead, her granddaughter sold it in an estate sale in 2001 to a gentleman named Kevin Manis. Kevin Manis purchased the box with the intent to give it to his mother as a gift. When he received the box, he started to experience various hauntings, one of which was a reoccurring dream, where he'd be walking through a park with a loved one. That loved one would then turn into an old hag and, quote, beat the living tar out of him. He would then wake up with mysterious bruises all over his body. Now, um, again, Kevin Manis did not make the connection that it was the box causing these hauntings, so he still gave it to his mother as a gift. His mother, upon opening the box, immediately suffered a stroke, lost 80% of her vision, and temporarily lost the ability to speak. The next day in the hospital, she very painfully wrote down two words for her son, Kevin, to read. Those two words were, hate, gift. So, uh, Kevin Manis got rid of the box, and eventually Jason Haxton purchased that box. Uh, now, Jason Haxton was a skeptic. He did not believe that the box was haunted. However, that changed very quickly because as soon as he received the box, he began to bleed from the eyes. He also started to experience the same old hack dreams that Kevin Manis had experienced. Now, this instilled fear of the box into Jason Haxton, and he acquired the help of some Jewish rabbis on how to dispose of the box. They told him it could not be done, but what you can do instead is further seal the divot. The way you do that is you build a custom-sized acacia wood box for the divot box to fit into. Uh, then in uh, now acacia wood is the same type of wood that King Solomon's temple is made out of, as well as the Ark of the Covenant. They also instructed Jason Haxon to inline the box with 24 karat gold, which has properties to ground the electromagnetic energies that emit from the Divic box. So Jason Haxon had this custom sized box built, he put the Divic box inside of it, he then put both boxes inside of a military cache style crate, and buried it six feet underground on his property where it lay dormant until Zach came around asking about it. Now at some point Sam Raimi heard about the box and he produced the possession, and what these actors are talking about are hauntings that would occur around set that they not, did not uh, experience on any other set in their entire careers. Actors, they also very briefly talk about how a few days after the filming uh, ended, the warehouse that housed all the props from the film mysteriously burned down to the ground. There were no signs of arson. Now that shirt that we have on display is one of the only surviving um, props from that film. Now before we enter this room, I do have to say that the hauntings the box give off are very real. I have great respect for what it can do. I've been in this next room when I've experienced a shadow figure loom over my shoulder. I've also been in this next room leading a tour when a woman who on my tour was looking straight at the box when she experienced very sharp pain go all the way down her back. We, I pulled out my flashlight to reveal three very large scratches going from her neck all the way down to her lower back. So the hauntings this thing gives off are very real. Uh, with that being said, if there's anyone in this room who does not wish to see the Divic Box, I understand. I'm just going to ask you to please wait outside by the banisters. Now, is there anyone in this room that is under 18? Sorry, you were not allowed to see the Divic Box. Is there no one else that is going to be joining her outside? Yeah. Go ahead and uh, go outside and wait yeah. by the banisters. I'll be joining in a moment. And it's like it's scary. So I let it go. It like tripped me out. Now without, um, actually I just need to make 100% sure that everyone in this room does want to see the video box, right? Yes. Okay, just needed that confirmation. Confirmation, confirmation, confirmation. Now without further ado, please follow me into the next room. That's probably the most intense experience I've had with, yeah. This room's interesting. There's lots of different vibes. It didn't scare, it just shocked me. I guess not scared, but it would be right like it shocked me. Because at the same time, it ripped my arm, it hit the thing, 
Hey guys, I want you to really listen to this EVP that I caught in the Dybbuk box room. It's not really an EVP. It sounds like a female dubs over our tour guide's voice, but it sounds like there's dual voices, but it doesn't sound like him. Listen to this. From the 1920s, a black candle and two locks of hair, one blonde and one brunette. from just viewing the episode, so if you do have heart conditions, I do not suggest you enter this next room. 
This next room is going to be a tight fit, so I'm going to have to split the group up. Um, let's have everyone on this part of the group to enter first, and then the rest of you will enter second. Now, I know this next part may sound strange, but as you enter, please say hello to Peggy, and as you leave, please say goodbye to Peggy. Um, it is the easiest way to protect That's yourself what from whatever it is that possesses roof. her. Do you remember how I said the roof? But it wasn't the roof, it was the holes. Yeah. Okay. That's what I was... Have you seen her? Have you looked at her? Yeah, I thought I she was on follow me. Oh, that's right. Okay. Ovulus, Peggy is nine, where it starts with Peggy's room.
Now, this contraption to my right is an iron lung. They were mainly used for polio patients and anyone who lost control of their uh, respiratory system. What was very unfortunate uh, about these is if you found yourself waking up in one, chances were you'd be spending the rest of your life inside of it, which is not something I can even come close to fathoming, only viewing the world upside down through this mirror. But thanks to things like the polio vaccine, these, this type of technology <coughs> is almost uh, it's close to becoming obsolete. Uh, as of 2014, 10 of them were still in use, so it's not quite yet a dead technology, but it, as I said before, it is working its way there. Zach acquired this particular iron lung from Dr. Bonnie Hammergren, who I mentioned once before, once owned that Liberace piano. Right this way, right this way. Now, uh, he is depicted in this photograph, posing with Zach. Uh, now, Dr. Hammergren actually wanted to be buried in this iron lung, but uh, was forced to sell off some of his oddities. Um, there are three more items of note in this room, uh, which are in this illuminated cabinet. We have a pickled human hand, a pickled human heart, and a pickled human brain. For those of you who can't view it, you will have a chance to see it as we make our way to the next exhibit. Now, our next exhibit does feature arguably one of the most genius brains to ever walk the planet. And now I know what you're all thinking. Craig, you're standing right in front of us. Why do we need to see an exhibit about you? No, it's not about me. It's about a Mrs. Lee Sober Shapiro. Um, and in fact, this next room is going to be uh, the tiny spinning room. It is the room we practice in the lobby for. So please play a game of sardines with your neighbors. <laughs> mentioned before, Lee Sober Shapiro was a genius. Her mind was described uh, to be that of a machine. Uh, she was many, many things. She was actually an astrologist. She was a sculptor. She was a musician. She was an artist. The list literally goes on and on, but her true passion lied with paranormal investigating. And in fact, her family was not very proud about that, so they did what they could to limit the information available about Lee Sober Shapiro, but we found what we could, and we now have it on display in this room. Now, um, Lee Sober Shapiro was instrumental in the development of certain uh, paranormal technologies, one of which being the anapathic pure. One of which being the anapathic pure, one of which being the anapathic pure, one of which being the anapathic purifying cylinder. And what that machine did was uh, do its best to uh, contain spirits within the cylinder that was in the machine, or at least hold them there long enough to record evidence of their existence. We have some Polaroids uh, on display there. Those enlarged Polaroids are of Lee Sober Shapiro's last moments on Earth. Uh, these do tell two stories. The first story are the last moments of her life. These were found around her dead body. The second story it tells is more of a belief. I believe it. Zach believes it. Most of our, actually, all of our tour guides believe it. And that is the uh, progression of a demonic possession. As you can see, her face grows more and more manic as the photographs go on and now, on. The day before she was found dead, she did call a family member and tell that family member that she saw demons emerging from her equipment. Uh, that family member then checked on her the very next day to find her body uh, with all of that equipment around her body, all of it still switched on. Now we have that very same equipment in the next room beyond that door there, and it is set up in a way that we feel Mrs. Shapiro was found on the day of her death. And it is the very same equipment she used in her investigations. These are not replicas. Could you please open that door, sir? And once you're done viewing the display, please make your way back out here, and we'll make our way into our next exhibit. Entering the yacht room. So this is the Natalie Wood room.
press release, he set up the yacht room to make it look like Natalie Wood's room aboard the yacht because he has one of her magazine racks in here from the actual yacht. Child protective services were called and the three children were seized for psychiatric evaluation. They all passed and no sign of abuse were found. However, 
During the evaluation of the youngest child, his eyes rolled into the back of his head. He began to uh, growl and curse. He then very calmly walked backwards up an eight foot pole, jumping at the top, landing on his feet as if nothing happened. This was witnessed by three people, a ER nurse, a child protective services caseworker, as well as a psychiatric evaluator. Now this is the most well-documented case of demonic possession to date. Zach heard about these uh, hauntings and he did an investigation at the demon house during which he watched a demon manifest before his eyes in the kitchen, which caused him permanent eye damage. Uh, it caused him permanent <coughs> double vision, which is now the reason he wears glasses. Those glasses are prism glasses. Now, Zach recognized the dangers of this house, purchased the house, and had the house destroyed. But before he destroyed the house, he saved the staircase that led to the basement, which was the most haunted room in the house. He also saved the dirt uh, from that staircase, as well as the tools that police found buried four feet under that dirt. Now, all of those things are on display in this room. Now, um, since the police found that collection of tools, a component has gone missing, and it is believed that since that component is missing, the vortex that those tools were used to open is still open and open in this room uh, next to me. Um, Zach also, before he destroyed the house, he also filmed the documentary of the house, which is due to premiere early next year in 11 major cities. Now, before I let you in, I do want to tell you about one more experience that happened in this room. Uh, a few months before we opened, Zach had some construction workers working in here when they experienced something so horrific, they just dropped their tools and ran out of the museum, and they still to this day refuse to step foot back in the museum. Zach does not know what they experienced, but maybe you'll get an idea as you enter. It is the only room that is protected by a crucifix, so please be aware of that. It is a very small room, so we may uh, only have that enough room for about five new. of you at a time. Once you're done viewing, please meet me on the other side next to that red light, and we will conclude our tour. So we just entered the demon house room. Rose's altar. Oh my god, there's a baby on the stairs. Oh, that's new. Oh my god, that baby's creepy. So Zach's gonna let us go in the basement and investigate. Oh, is that okay? If you want to. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead and join the rest of the group right over there. Uh, I think we're going with Zach. Oh, he's gonna meet you in the kitchen. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right over here. Along this yeah. hall, right over here. You guys go with Blake. Follow Blake. Okay. And then the ghost and then I'll come. The okay, yeah. okay. Stay with him and I'll be with Zach. And then I'll come get you if I need to.